This is the Pastor Podcast with Randy and Andy. Andy Payton is the lead pastor at Methodist Temple United Methodist Church in Evansville, Indiana. Randy Moore is associate pastor at Methodist Temple. Their goal is to see Christ in everything and everyone. Welcome into the podcast, everybody. I'm Randy Moore, along with Andy Payton. We're pastors at Methodist Temple in Evansville, Indiana, and it's a special day today. We've been having some special days. A few weeks ago, we celebrated our 50th podcast, so it's not 500, but hey, 50 is pretty good. Yeah. We survived this long. Maybe we'll make it to 500, and today we are, um, what's the word, uh, acknowledging, celebrating the fact that uh, we've come to the end of another sermon series. We have. So for 21 weeks, or maybe more, um, we've been taking a look at the stained glass windows at Methodist Temple and creating a sermon series out of that, because half of the stained glass windows depict the Beatitudes, and the other half depict some of the parables of Jesus. And last week, we came to the last one. And so I think it's been very beneficial. I made this comment in the uh, in the welcome on Sunday that no longer are the stained glass windows just decorations. They're actually something that we've spent some time with. We spent 21 weeks on. And so when we walk into the sanctuary, we have a new appreciation for the for the meaning that is literally surrounding us. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that's that's valuable, you know, in and of itself. So we're going to jump into this uh, this last parable. It's the parable of the ten bridesmaids. But before we do that, we want to do our soul check in, uh, which is we something we do most of the time. But um, this week, I, I have the opportunity to talk about how Scripture actually does uh, feed my soul and help helps my soul prosper. Because I'm going to be preaching Sunday, and um, I mentioned this before in the podcast, but um, I have a Bible study, a, a Zoom Bible study on on uh, Wednesdays, and we've been studying the book of Mark. Well, I'm going to preach Sunday, and I decided it's going to be the one Sunday between sermon series. Mm-hmm. So there's a sermon series on the stained glass windows, then the sermon series on worship. So I just went to the lectionary. And it's Mark uh, chapter 7, and in my Bible study of Mark, tomorrow, we're recording on Tuesday, tomorrow, on Wednesday, before Sunday, we are at Mark chapter 7. So, and you've been encouraging us to notice, we <laughs> just notice where God is, right. you know. Yeah. So um, those, those synchronicities is yeah. the language I sometimes use, or quiet. I also refer to those moments as sort of like quiet miracles, like you know, yeah. things coming together that are. It just seems more than a coincidence. Right. Right. So what I'm going to do, I think, uh, when we meet tomorrow on Zoom and look at this, I'm going to use um, I'm going to use my group as kind of a focus group and try some ideas out on them on on the sermon. And um, I mean, I know it sounds obvious to say that um, we see God through Scripture uh, because we spend a lot of time saying that we see God outside of Scripture as well. If God is God, then God is uh, not confined to a book. Um, but clearly, uh, Scripture um, study and applying Scripture and meditating on Scripture and being open to uh, the Spirit while reading Scripture uh, those are those are certainly ways that uh, will prosper our souls. Absolutely, yeah. Um, for me, I guess where I, where I'm tuning into God's presence most recently was the devotion we had during our staff meeting. Mm-hmm. Randy, you shared a devotion from one of my favorite scholars or spiritual teachers, Richard Rohr. Yes, and he had uh, it was a meditation on 65 different definitions or titles for the Holy Spirit. Right. And uh, the one of the definitions or titles that came out for me was compassionate observer. Yeah. And the, the challenge was to consciously and actively draw upon that. So I'm thinking about what does it mean to be a compassionate observer and to kind of take that posture of how does God see this and how does God see this internally as well? Because um, and in that case, when I mean see me, Right. How do I adopt the the uh, posture of a ob- compassionate observer when it comes to my own inner world and all that's happening? I, and that's where spiritual formation really is, right? It's all the internal. It's all the internal. What's your internal motivation if we're going to grow up 
in terms of the journey. It's all about like what's happening on what's happening within really. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You can see the application, but also even before we make the application to our own lives, what a relief it is to appreciate God as a compassionate observer. Right. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, Because a lot of people think that God is not, is an observer, sees all things. Yeah. Not so compassionate, but not so compassionate about it. (laughs) That's true. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. God God loves us. I mean, we should at least love ourselves at least that much. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and I think sometimes I, I I mean, I mean, for me, I'm sometimes my own worst critic. Mm -hmm. You Mm -hmm. shouldn't have said that. You shouldn't have done that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Boy, that voice can become very strong. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, mine was, and there were 65, as you mentioned, Richard Rohr mentioned 65, because it was his 65th birthday, and so he came up with 65, and that was 10 years ago already. The one that I wrote down is inner anointing. Mm. You know, We think about an outer anointing you know, sometimes, even though we don't, we don't do a lot of anointing, but when we do, it's an external anointing maybe for, for healing, but um, inner anointing. And then I asked the group then to... Um, just maybe choose one or two out of those 65 and um, hold on to it today mm-hmm. and, you know, meditate on it, even if it's, a, you know, a minute at a time and see. And Roar, even at the end of the meditation, mentioned that the more we do that, you know, just like you've been teaching for such a long time now, the more we do that, the more we're aware of the presence of the Holy Spirit or the presence of God. Mm-hmm. All right, let's jump in here. This is this last parable. And again, we've been doing the sermon series on the stained glass windows here at Methodist Temple. This is a, a parable that comes from Matthew in the 25th chapter. And uh, a lot of people, when you hear Matthew 25, will think of the, uh, the sheep and the goats and the, you know, the last judgment. But this comes from you know, what's called, it has a lot of names, but it's called the, the judgment discourse. There are five discourses in Matthew, and this one it comes toward the end in chapter 25. And it's the um, end time discourse or the judgment discourse or the apocalyptic discourse. And we're, we're talking about, you know, what happens at the end of time. Um, and then what do we, more, more importantly for us now, what do we do in the meantime? It's not just this gazing off waiting, this inactive waiting, but, a, but an active uh, waiting on God. And so Jesus um, tries to make this point. He does it in... Um, there are several parables here. They actually start in uh, 24, um, but this is 25, 1 to 13. Let me just read it. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like this. Ten young women took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five were wise. When the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them, but the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed... All of them became drowsy and slept. But at midnight, there was a shout, Look, here's the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. Then all those young women got up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise replied, No, there will not be enough for you and for us. You'd better go to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they went to buy it, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went with them into the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the other young women came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he replied, Truly I tell you, I do not know you. Keep awake, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. All right, that's the parable of the ten bridesmaids. And it requires, and you opened your sermon this way, it requires a bit of an understanding about what a wedding entailed in the first century Palestine. Yeah, I mean, every culture and every generation really has its own way of celebrating a wedding, and and that is definitely true for the first century context in which this would have been written, because just taking at face value this parable, it's kind of hard to, okay, what's going on, you know? (laughs) What, why why are they doing these things? <laughs> right. <laughs> I, I find it fascinating that of all the windows that we would have ended on, this is the one. And I think it's because it has to do with the, the judgment. There's a judgment kind of 
layer to this parable. And so the last window probably has to do with the final judgment as go. well. Yeah. I think that's probably what they were thinking when they when they built the, right. the sanctuary and made the stained glass windows. Although I I find myself thinking a lot about the fact that there was no miracles mentioned in any of the windows. In all twenty one. Uh-huh. I'm, I'm I don't know. I'm I'm like, why did they do that? That I mean, is we could have yeah. the storm. I wonder what the stained glass window would look like if Jesus calmed the storm. We could have had the water into wine. I wonder what the stained glass window would look like with the water to wine. The feeding of the five thousand and the four thousand. Five thousand, four thousand. Yeah, I wonder what that would have looked like too. Because there's such truth in those stories. And they're more than just stories. I, I don't want people just to think I'm right. you know, I do think there's definitely something historical happening in those stories, but there's something in those and I don't know. Anyway, we we're, gonna have, we're supposed to focus on the lamps. Yeah, and we were. We talked about this before. We would have loved to have been a fly on the wall when the people have met this temple back in in the 50s? 1950s, yeah. In the 1950s, put this together. And, right. Um, and for what reasons? And why did they leave the miracles out? And how did they decide to depict uh, the life of Jesus and the parables and the Beatitudes in the way that they did? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, it just a, it's another example of context. Mm-hmm. Every generation has its own context, its own reason for doing things. Just as there's a reason for the re- there's a reason for why Jesus tells this particular parable, this particular story in the first century context, and the stained glass windows are the same thing. It's depicting, it's depicting something from that time period. And to really understand it, we have to understand the context too, or at least be sensitive to it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I hope I'm not throwing you a curveball here, but I puzzled over this. Please and, do. Okay, all yeah. right. I puzzled over this. Where's the bride? Right. Uh, this is the parable of the ten bridesmaids. Yeah. Where's it, the bride? Because it's my understanding that when the bridegroom arrived back at his father's house or his house... Wedding started. The, the wedding started, and he's bringing the bride. So I, I, I guess the simple answer, not to answer the question, you know, what I'm asking you to answer, I guess the simple thing is, is that she's implied. Or I, I don't know. I, <laughs> this is a very challenging parable. I, I'm just going to throw that out. <laughs> Again, I'm throwing a lot of things out, I guess. But uh, this is a challenging parable. It could be that the, the people gathered are the bride in the sense that they're representative of the church. Sometimes the church is described as the bride of Christ. That might have been implied. Mm-hmm. And what was happening here, again, this is a parable to the church, wanting the church to continue to be faithful, even though Christ has not came back or Christ has not reappeared in the timeline in which they had anticipated. That's basically this parable. And so I kind of thought maybe the the women gathered the ten are like the church. Mm-hmm. And so they are the bride in a sense. And I don't know. It, yeah. I, I kind of I wrestle with this idea of Christ being like the groom, and the church being like the bride. Mm-hmm. I I just always wrestled with that metaphor personally, but um, even though it's in the Old Testament and the New it's Testament, of, and, it's yeah, just yeah. part of it. Like mm-hmm. if you're going to read the Bible, sometimes you have to wrestle with stuff, and this is one of those moments for me. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So and well, I have a lot of challenges with the parable, as I kind of mentioned in my sermon. You know, why can't they share their oil? Why does the door get shut and they can't get back in? I mean, why did they think they could go find oil at midnight? Everyone's asleep. I mean, is there a store open somewhere? Doubt it. It's a first century context. There's no convenience stores. There's so many questions. But why couldn't they be let in late? Yeah. Knock, knock, knock. Hey, I'm sorry. You know, <laughs> We're just oh, a little come late. On in. Yeah. 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 I well, I don't know. Is, I, it, is this part of it? It's that uh, Jesus would set his parables in a familiar uh, setting or in a familiar background, farming or raising sheep or a wedding. And then it's where the story deviates from what's been set up that the point is made. You know, for instance, in the parable of the prodigal son, the father never would have given his inheritance away. That just wouldn't have happened uh, culturally. Before he died, he wouldn't have given his inheritance away. So that signals, okay, we're not talking about a first century father. We're talking about God. Right. You know, so maybe here. Um, the deviation is the, deviation, the message. It, it might yeah. be I, part of the message. I can, yeah. I can certainly go along with that. Yeah. Um, definitely. Yeah. And 
well, the, the, the last line, I, you get the punchline, keep awake. Yeah. Pay attention. Don't walk away. You might miss Jesus. Mm-hmm. Essentially is what it's getting at. And there's some very practical implications there. Be present to the presence of God. Don't deviate. Don't walk away. Mm-hmm. And, of course, no one can make you do that. Hence, they can't share the oil. No one can make... I can't make Randy, for example, be present to the presence of God and stay awake for Jesus, nor can Randy make Andy <laughs> be present to the presence of God and stay awake from Jesus. That's our that's our own personal choice, and that's what this kind of parable is kind of depicting too. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I kind of talked about why do people walk away from the church? Yeah, that's the tact that that you took. Why yeah. do people walk away from the church? Because they, the bridesmaids left, they left and missed it. Yes. Yeah. Thomas left and, and missed, missed it. it. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Peter didn't stay in the boat. He, Peter got out of the boat, thought he could walk and couldn't. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I. That's the challenge is to stay the course. How do we stay the course? And uh, over the years, I've heard a lot of reasons why people have kind of struggled with their faith, walked away with their faith. A whole litany of them. Sometimes people cite hypocrisy of the church. Sometimes people cite the judgmentalness, the judgmentalness of the church. They've been judged by the church. Um, sometimes pain happens. Hey, let me stop you right there because you said something that I want you to expand on. You said something a couple of weeks ago when you were talking about your own um, calling or your own mission, and you said it was to be a ministry to people who have been hurt by the church. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm just trying to be a place, a pastor, and we're trying to be a place that embodies a hospitable community where people are free to ask questions and people are free to come here and be themselves and wrestle with this thing that we call God. We're trying to create a culture around that basic idea. And coming to a place like this, if you've not always experienced that within the church, is a sense of, that becomes a sense of healing and starts to build back the trust that had been lost. Because a lot of times I think, and we've talked about this in the podcast, Randy, I think we mistake faith for certainty. or synonyms for one another, Mm -hmm. but that's not faith. I I heard a great definition of faith. I was just telling you before the podcast, I heard a great definition uh, from Kierkegaard, actually, who said, faith is like risk with direction. (laughs) It's perfect. I I don't have it all figured out. This, This makes the most sense to me. I'm going to risk myself for this. And so we want to be the type of community where people feel safe to experience that risk with direction in their lives. And so if someone has a question, if we don't always agree, I mean, if there's anything we should be humble about, it should be our understanding of God, our comprehension of the Almighty. We're finite beings, right? I mean, God's, I, I'm pretty sure, infinite, or at least bigger than I am. <laughs> so. I can't put myself in this place because I've been in the church all of my life, but you talk about uh, being a safe place and a, a place where um, you're not going to be hurt or a place where you're going to be judged. I wonder when people enter a church you know, for the first time, whether, one of the, whether there is a question that exists in their mind as they walk through the doors— is this place going to be safe? Yes. You know, you think there's, the, I mean, there must be. Oh, you know. well, if, you, if, you've, if you've grown up in a religious environment where at a very early age you're presented with an understanding of God that's less than compassionate mm-hmm. and you internalize that, you carry that with you. I'm convinced. You carry that with you. In your head, you might even know. Hey, God loves me like Jesus. Hey, God loves me. My head tells me that. Even then, the heart's still saying something else. And coming into a, a church on a Sunday morning could be a triggering type of experience for folks. And so, and perfect though we may be, we're trying to become a community where people can kind of work through that pain so that, quite frankly, we can be set free to love one another in the way that I think God has intended us to love one another. And And boy, that's not... I don't know if I have the answer to how that happens necessarily, Randy. Um, but I can say the way we have grown as a congregation, a lot of times 
God will bring us people who, for whatever reason, have been wounded at other faith communities. Well, it just makes me think that uh, virtual worship is a gift of is a gift of God because it's become the new front door. You used to have to actually walk into a church and take that risk. Yes. You know? Now you don't. Right. In fact, that's I don't remember the statistic, but so many people church shop sample virtually. In fact, uh, it was either last Sunday or the Sunday before a woman by the name of Julie walked up to me after the service and she said. I've been watching online, hmm. and then she showed up, you know, so maybe you can judge, well, that's From probably not, not the right word to is use this, in this context. Is this context, the kind of but, vibe I'm looking yeah. for? You know, mm-hmm. absolutely. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, okay, so there's hypocrisy, uh, there's judgmentalism, uh, there's the idea that I gave it my best shot, just didn't get the re- get the results out of it. Mm-hmm. It could be a number of different reasons why yeah. the faith stop, stops working for us. I, I would say tragedy in our lives, too. That's probably a big one. I didn't get into that. I didn't bring that up specifically in my sermon for a reason. And the, the reason is because it's such a big topic. Um, why does God allow bad things to happen to good people? Mm-hmm. You say, God loves me. Why did God allow this? I don't even have the answer. I don't have the answer to that. I couldn't even answer this that in the podcast. I mean... What I can give is the example of Christ. I mean, the Christian, the central, the central Christian narrative is that Jesus dies and tragedy hits him, and then there's resurrection. And as a people of faith, we're not guaranteed that we won't experience that pain, but we can be a hopeful people that look for the gift of resurrection in the midst of it too. Well, that's the beautiful thing about the about the Gospel of Mark. I mentioned that we're studying it, and we're going, and we're really slow walking through it. We've been at this for many, many weeks, and we're only up to chapter 7. But one thing that I think is very cool about the Gospel of Mark is that it's only the beginning of the Gospel. That's what Mark says in the beginning. This is the beginning of the good news. Uh, it's only the beginning. Thank God it's only the beginning because it's a tragic story. It's tragedy. Jesus is left totally abandoned on the cross. There's an empty tomb, but the women run away in fear. End of the story? No. End of the beginning of the story. Because we know there was another part of the story. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah. 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 It's good stuff. Mm -hmm. Challenging stuff, but good stuff. I I told my son, I mean... We're on one today. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I told my Sunday school class, uh, we were talking in Sunday school class, what do you like most about Jesus? We were ju- we just got in that conversation, and people were just naming different things. And I said, you know, he never wrote anything. I love that about Jesus. As, as someone who week after week reads the text and tries to put it in context and and just all this Bible stuff and all these creeds and these theologies, the guy never wrote anything. Mm-hmm. He didn't talk about humility. He practiced it. He didn't give us like a eight page paper on what humility is. He just practiced it. He didn't. He didn't debate about equality. He practiced it. And the fact is, like after he was risen, who did he appear to first? Women. Mm-hmm. In a man's world, Jesus appeared to women. He didn't. Uh, he didn't give us a a 12-part series on love, he loved. And in doing that, he incarnated really what the spiritual life is meant to look like. And so I, I just find that fascinating as a pastor who I'm a paid interpreter in a sense. You know, that's what I do. I interpret. Professional. Yeah. Professional interpreter, yeah. yeah. Um, I just think the fact, I go back to this idea that we have an incarnational Savior who invites us to incarnate it as well. And it goes back to this principle of we experience as much of God as we're willing to practice in our lives. And so that that would be my best avenue to someone who's struggling with their faith. I would say, don't try to figure it out. Mm -hmm. Go practice it. Mm -hmm. You want to know about humility? Become humble. Mm -hmm. You want to know about the poor? Go get to go meet the poor. You want to know about love? Practice love, and then in doing so, you begin to live yourself into a new experience of God. And so, 
that to me at the end of the day is the tragedy of walking away because it, this is like a, an act of mysticism or a practice mysticism or to use the Wesley uh, phrase, a practical divinity. Mm-hmm. That's, that's the way. Anyway. There's an interesting uh, tidbit about uh, Jesus not writing anything. Of course, he wrote one thing in the Gospel of John. There's that story, which was not in the original manuscripts of the um, uh, the woman caught in adultery. Mm-hmm. He, he writes in the ground. Yes. What did he What did he write? That's he could have played tic tac toe for all we know. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. But if he had written something, can you imagine how that would just be ripped apart? It would just. I mean. You know, yeah. Uh, yeah. But it's the. I was going through my journal the other day, and I, I wrote about this moment. I, I was standing, honestly, at a bar. I was on vacation, standing at a bar, and me and this guy were talking. And he says, so what do you do? And I say, I'm a pastor. And I, he said something about religion. And I responded to him. I was like, oh, yeah, there's all kinds of different language systems out there when it comes to religion. But love looks the same wherever you go. Mm-hmm. And that's the thing that Jesus does here. If he gave us, if he actually wrote something down, we'd be arguing about it from now to kingdom come. Mm -hmm. Hence, look at what we do with the Bible. But that's not what he did at the end of the day. He he practiced this love that it's true wherever you go. It's it's in a sense ultimate truth. I, I find it again and again. Like we can argue all day about Christianity or Let's just talk about Christ for a little bit mm-hmm. and what he actually did. Mm-hmm. And it's a unifying force. So, Very, very good. We're off on a few sidetracks here, but that, so let's bring it back to, um, you mentioned someone, maybe I, I, I take notes on Andy's sermons, and uh, sometimes I get these names he, he puts out there right, sometimes you get them wrong. Was it Markham Davis? Yeah, yeah he, wrote, he wrote a book on legacy, mm-hmm. and he used the acronym for PEACE. And I think it does a nice job talking about what does it really look like to be a disciple of Jesus, um, but also what does it look like to live a life of legacy that has an impact on others long after we're gone. And the way he he came to this acronym was, A, he is a Christian, and he studied the Bible, sure, but he also went to funerals, and he began to listen about what do what do people actually talk about after a person's gone, what has the biggest impact? And so as a result of that kind of research, he came up with this acronym PEACE, and he said the most important things it seemed like were people, uh, experiences were talked about, how a person used their assets, um, creativity, the things that they created, and then, uh, of course, expressions of kindness. And I, I just I find that to be a helpful thing to just help me really stay grounded on what's most important in my life and where do I actually have long-term impact upon others. And the first and most obvious one is the people in my life, the my inner circle, the people I work with, the people who see me every day, my family, especially my family, my children. Um, this is what has the biggest impact. And then experience, when we talk about our stories, what do we talk about? We talk about on the adventures we, we have gone on. Like, like if, as a family, what stories do we share as a family? Our vacations, right. our adventures, right? And uh, Davis does a good job talking about how, like in the Bible, the great people in the Bible that we talk about, we talk about them because they went on an adventure. Mm-hmm. Like Abraham's the classic example. This old, old man hears this voice from God that says, Go into an unknown land. And that now, guess what? He's like the father of the faith. Yeah. And why? Because he was willing to go on the adventure. Jesus left Nazareth. He didn't stay put. He went off to Jordan River, and then he went out, run around. He went outside a home. And he proved you can't go home again because when he got back home, they didn't like they him didn't anymore. Like it. No. Yeah. yeah. So... I, that experience aspect of impact um, within the life of the church, sometimes we build in experiences that really can have this impact. And a big example would be mission trips, going to places like Guatemala, um, 
going on a service, having a service day like we did at the Diamond Valley Park, and that, we talked about that in the sermon. But these are the types of things where we meet God, really. Um, we meet God when we are willing to go outside of our routine. And then that teaches us how to see the world different. So back to Jesus. Jesus leaves home. He goes back home, and he doesn't fit there anymore. Why? Because he left home. Right. Um, and then uh, assets, of course, um, how we use the gifts we've been given, whether or not we use them for ourselves or for others. That's an obvious way we have an impact. Um, time, talent, treasures, especially we got our stewardship card today. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I saw a funny thing on Facebook. Uh, it was, I forget what it was. Like, well, you know this person, I forget what they were talking about. They, they said, you know this person has actually served on a stewardship committee at some point because they're talking in the la- speaking in the language of time, talent, and treasures. <laughs> <laughs> That's such an almost cliche thing that we talk about as Christians in the church. Um, uh, and the, the other one uh, Davis talked about was creativity. God's a creator. We're made in the image of God, therefore we're called to create things. We're all called to create. Um, take that risk of creation, art, music. But I would also say like people who started a business, mm-hmm. that's a manifestation of that. Like they, they, That's a huge risk. But think about the fact that when you're gone, what, what are people going to talk about? Even if it doesn't work out, they're going to say, you know, they'll still talk about like they had a business or something, you know, you know. And the other thing he talked about, Davis, was like, he's a writer, wrote books. That's going to impact people. Even after he's gone, that book will still exist in some fashion. And so, the, I mean, even to, in my life today, I can think of folks like, I never met them, but I read them all the time, and they still impact me. It's legacy, right? And then uh, the biggest one's expressions of kindness. At the end of the day, people remember how you made them feel. Yep. So that's good. That, that's good. It's helpful. Someone came up to me and said, we ought to put that on a wall somewhere or something. It's helpful. Yeah. It really is. Yeah. So. All yeah. right. You wrapped up with Romans 12, 18 and 21. Yeah. I came up with that passage and in devotion the week before. And mm. that's towards the end of the Paul's letter to the church in Rome. And he says, basically, and so, you know, I'm paraphrasing here. Do the best you can to live at peace with one another. And, and then he goes on to say, overcome evil with good. And that's how you win. You practice peace and you overcome evil with the practice of good. Mm-hmm. Don't give up. And maybe at the end of the day, that's why a lot of us just walk away from all of this peace and people and experiences, asset, all that. You look at the world and you think, what's the use? And you forfeit the legacy. You know, you forfeit the impact you could have had. So, that's the party. Go very, back to the parable. Very good. Yeah, the uh, the wedding banquet. Yeah. Okay, so um, I'm going to be preaching this Sunday, and as I mentioned before, we're in between sermon series. Did you want to say something very briefly about the worship series that's coming up? Yeah, a couple of weeks ago, um, we had So That Sunday, and everyone got a chart that kind of mapped out what discipleship looks like, what spiritual growth looks like, and so... As we go into the fall, we're going to break those down and talk about the different aspects of spiritual formation in our lives when it comes to our worship, uh, community, service, and also spiritual practices. And so for the month of September, we're going to zero in on worship and how that is meant to form the dispositions of our lives and how ultimately that should lead, when we worship consistently, what worship would lead to is a We talked about those synchronicities or quiet miracles. We begin to notice God in our day-to-day lives. That's what worship really is meant to do, kind of wake us up again so we remember God. Anyway, that's what we're going to be doing. Thanks. Uh, We'll look forward to that. Okay, so we're on this in-between Sunday, this coming Sunday, and I will be preaching. And I just, as I said in the beginning, I I just decided I'll just go back to to the lectionary. And the lectionary has this lesson from the seventh chapter of Mark, and it goes, and the lectionary does this sometimes. It um, it doesn't take the complete text. It sort of edits uh, edits it some. And so it's Mark 7, 1 to 8, and then 14 to 15, and then 21 to 23. And I think those sections were taken out because, uh, for one, they get into some things that might just get the conversation sidetracked. The other thing is there's actually uh, there's a poop joke in there. And uh, I'll, let the, I'll let the listener find... <laughs> 
reads uh, chapter 7, find the poop joke in there. there. There is one, if I may say that. And, uh, but anyway, let me read it. This is Mark 7, 1 to 8, 14 to 15, 21 to 23. Now, when the Pharisees and some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem gathered around him, they noticed that some of his disciples were eating with defiled hands, that is, without washing them. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they thoroughly wash their hands, thus observing the tradition of the elders. And they do not eat anything from the market unless they wash. And there are also many other traditions that they observe, the washing of cups and pots, bronze kettles and beds. So the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? He said to them, Isaiah prophesied rightly about you hypocrites. As it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching human precepts as doctrines. You abandon the commandment of God and hold to human tradition. Then he called the crowd again and said to them, Listen to me, all of you, and understand There is nothing outside a person that by going in can defile, but the things that come out are what defile. For it is from within, from the human heart, that evil intentions come, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, avarice, wickedness, deceit, debauchery, envy, slander, pride, folly. All these evil things come from within, and they defile a person." I'll just do a quick preview. I know both of us have to get on, get on down the road here. But um, this is why, you know, a biblical, critical biblical study is important because it sounds like, well, why wouldn't they wash their hands before they eat? Well, it's not about, it's not about hygiene. It's about a tradition that had been passed down, and traditions are good. But what, and Jesus isn't condemning uh, traditions, but what he's saying is, let's get to the real point. What, where all of these, this list here at the end, where those things come from, they don't come from the outside, they come from the inside. So let's, with the love of God, purify our hearts that these, uh, that this, we don't show up in, in this list. And so, um, it, it, this is one of those texts that you just need to take a closer uh, look at it. Um, you know, we have traditions in the church that they're very fine. They're very fine traditions, and they mean a lot. You know, traditions are are they're they're so important, but when they become all important and lead to arguments like the color of the carpeting or the way we do communion or the you know, then then we lose sight of what's really important. But I think at the same time, at the same time that we try to see the deeper meaning, we do not criticize those things uh, that have become traditions because they those tra- those traditions create community, right? And they set us apart, and they and they you know they bring that kind of unity. Anyway, we're going to dig into that uh, this Sunday, and um, and then begin a new sermon series the following week on worship. All right. Very good. Thanks, Pastor Andy. Enjoy it as always. Listeners, thank you so much. We'll see you next week. This has been the Pastor Podcast with Randy and Andy. You are welcome to join us at Methodist Temple in person or online. Methodist Temple is at 2109 Lincoln Avenue in Evansville, Indiana. Our traditional Sunday morning worship service is at 830 with our contemporary service at 11. Log on to our website at methodisttemple.church. We see Christ in you.